A few videos ago, I discussed the 1 over f temporal structure of spectral and time frequency brain activity. And in that video, I said that there are two approaches for dealing with this 1 over f structure. One approach is to normalize it out. And there I introduced you to uh, two methods, mainly decibel, that's what I focused most on. And then you can also use percent change, so some kind of divisive normalization. And then I also mentioned that another option for dealing with the 1 over f structure is to embrace it, to analyze it and study it, because this 1 over f structure reflects the fact that the brain is in a scale-free state, or a state that approaches criticality. And so that's what we are going to focus on in this video. In particular, I'm going to tell you about an analysis method called detrended fluctuation analysis, sometimes abbreviated as DFA. And that is probably the main method that people use for analyzing temporal structure in scale-free dynamics. So I want to start by calling up a slide that I used in a previous video. So there I mentioned that when you have scale-free networks, you will find that these statistical descriptive statistical measures of central tendency are generally not very informative. So that's things like the mean or the median or the mode. If you look at this distribution of earthquake magnitudes as a function of earthquake frequency, you can see that yeah, these measures, that there is no real central tendency here. So you technically could compute the average of all these numbers, but the average is not very informative about what's happening here. And so systems that exhibit this kind of scale-free or fractal characteristic are often said to be in a critical state or a state that is approaching criticality. And that means that these systems are maximally flexible for adapting to different kinds of environments or different kinds of inputs. So in this video, I'm not really going to say much more about the theory of scale-free dynamics. Instead, I want to focus more on the analysis method of DFA, detrend and fluctuation analysis. However, I do want to highlight just two findings out of many. There are many, many studies on temporal dynamics and 1 over f characteristics in brain activity. But this is just two examples to show you that these kinds of 1 over f dynamics are actually related to various characteristics that people might be interested in, such as age. So you can see comparing the EEG or the temporal structure of EEG signals from young adults versus older adults, and they primarily differ in the rate at which the energy decays over different frequencies, with older adults having a more shallow 1 over f. And here you see another example. I actually forget what was the point to this study, but you do see comparing the red line and the blue line that there are differences. Uh, so there are peaks in the spectrum, but if you look across the peaks, you can also see that there's a difference in the 1 over f characteristics. Now, you can quantify 1 over f in the frequency domain like this, but it's also common to measure this in the time domain. So to look for scale-free dynamics using the time domain version of the signal. And that is the idea of the detrended fluctuation analysis. So there's a couple of steps to computing the DFA, and I'm going to walk you through them. So you start with your signal, and then step one is to convert that signal into a mean-centered cumulative sum. So that means your signal might start off looking something like this, and then you start by mean centering the signal. So that's pretty easy. You just subtract the mean. And then you compute the cumulative sum. The cumulative sum means that you take each time point and add it to the previous time point. And that gives you quite a different looking characteristic signal. So this is the mean centered cumulative sum of this signal here. And what you see in this means, uh, in this cumulative sum, version of this signal is these longer trends. So what you don't see so much here, so here you see the signal is going up and down, of course. But what you can see here in this version, in the cumulative sum, which you don't really see here, is that in this part of the signal here, there are more jumps going downwards than there are jumps going upwards. So of course there are increases in the signal energy, but there's more steps going down than there are and fewer steps going up. And here it's the opposite for this area of the signal here. And now for electrophysiology, it's actually common not to do this analysis on the time domain signal itself, the original time domain signal, 
but on the power spectrum or the amplitude spectrum. So this signal would actually come from first computing the amplitude time series from, for example, wavelet convolution, and then you work with the amplitude time series. Okay, so this is step one. Then we have step two, which is to define a number of scales that are logarithmically spaced. So a scale here just refers to a width of time. So what you're seeing here is the plot of these scales. So in this case, I chose 20 scales, and each scale has a different duration. So you can see the first scale is one second. It's a window of one second. And then up to scale 20, which in this case is, I guess it's around 23 seconds or so. So you can see that these scales actually get really long. This is not an analysis that you can apply to brief task-related epochs. You need a really, really long time series to do this analysis. It should be, you know, it's typically done during spontaneous activities or resting state activity, where you might have, for example, 10 minutes of the, the research participant not really doing anything, just sitting in a chair relaxing. Okay, so then, so now we have step two. We have all of these scales, so 20 scales ranging from one second to 23 seconds or whatever. And then what you do with these scales is you use them to cut the data into epochs. So we have this really long time series, and let's say this is 10 minutes long or something. And then what we do is epoch the data. So we segment the data according to these different scales. So the longest scale that I showed here was 23 seconds. So each one of these windows might be 23 seconds. Sometimes you get a little bit at the end here. You get some, some little bit that doesn't fit into one of these segments, which is fine. It's generally just a small amount of data. Okay, so then each segment gets detrended, and then you compute the root mean square. So that would look something like this. So now I've converted all of these segments in here into these segments, these time series. Now this looks like it might be short, but each one of these is, you know, the time scale here is 23 seconds. So this could actually be pretty long. So this first signal here, this first segment here would come from this one, and then it's just detrended. So you remove this trend line. And then for each one of these, you compute the root mean square. The root mean square is a pretty simple calculation. And to interpret this, you basically just read this title backwards. So first you square all of the individual elements. So this would be I uh, time points, so N time points in this segment here. So you square each individual element, and then you compute the mean, which is summing up all the squared terms and dividing by n, and then you compute the square root. So root mean squared is computed as the square, and then the mean, and then the root. This is actually a very closely related concept to variance. This is a measure of the total energy in the signal. Now I have this little subscript s here, because you get a different root mean square for each scale. So this would be the root mean square just for this one scale, 23 seconds. Now you compute this root mean square for each one of these time segments individually, and then you average all these together. So that gives you, at the end of step three, that gives you one value of root mean square averaged across all these different segments for this one particular scale. Okay, and then we repeat this step for all of the different scales. So previously I said that that was 23 seconds, maybe this one is 18 seconds or something. So this is now 18 seconds instead of 23 seconds. So when you finish going through this procedure, you will have a vector of scales that I showed uh, a moment ago, and a vector of root mean square values. And then you plot them on a line in a plot where, where the axes are both log scaled. So this is the log of the root mean square and the log of the data scale or the time scale. And then you just compute the linear fit between these. And what you will always find is that this relationship is positive and it's generally linear in this log log scale, which means it's actually a log relationship, but we look for a linear fit. And the theoretical value of the DFA for pure white noise is 0.5. So you can see this is uh, empirical noise. So I simulated random numbers, and then I got an empirical DFA of 0.506. So it's really, really close to the theoretical value of 0.5. And then you see in your data, this is the real data, you will get a DFA value. This is often called a Hurst exponent. This, this slope here, the slope of this line is called the Hurst exponent. And in this case, it ended up being uh, 0.87. 
And the interpretation of this value is that systems that have long-range memory, so strong positive autocorrelations in time, have uh, Hurst exponents that are higher than 0.5, generally somewhere close to 1 or between 0.5 and 1. So this is indicative of a system that is in a critical state. And this is actually an interesting value here, 0.87, because when you look in the literature, in the neuroscience literature, you will find that Hurst exponents from exactly computed based on exactly this analysis description here, they tend to be somewhere around 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So this is a pretty typical value that you see across a large range of data sets and individuals. All right, so this is an overview of the analysis procedure for computing detrended fluctuation analysis. As I mentioned, it's often used to study the criticality of systems. In neuroscience, people use DFA analysis to study various patient groups, for example, comparing this Hurst exponent between individuals with Alzheimer's versus controls or individuals with schizophrenia versus controls or healthy aging and so on. This is generally something that fluctuates over slower timescales like minutes, hours, to decades. So a DFA analysis can be interesting, but this is not an analysis that you can apply to a kind of brief task-related design where your data epochs are only a few seconds long.